Welcome to Epoch's number 21, hosted by me, Bo Dade, and I'm joined by Josh Firm. Hello. How are you, Josh? I'm very well. Good. Looking forward to this. This is a prominent figure from where I'm from, so it's good to be talking about something close to home. How are you doing anyway? Yeah, fine, yeah. Um, Fr- so Francis Drake is a, a bit of a hero of mine, um, you know, ranks up there with... What, like the Duke of Wellington, you know, that sort of thing, like sort of a national hero, um, obviously dating from the 16th century, so quite old. But um, yeah, I'm sort of been familiar with his life and career and exploits f- since I was a small child. So I've gone over and over and over it <laughs> many times. So i um, happy to do it again. And I understand you, you're sort of aware of the big points, but maybe not all the minutiae mm-hmm. of, of what exactly well, what he did. Being a fellow Plumovian, we, we got taught a lot about him in school, so I imagine it's very dependent on the quality of the education I, re- I received, which probably not the best, but right, okay, we'll, we'll see. I, I obviously know bits and pieces. I know lots of the local area where he grew up, but other than that... Mm, yeah, well, I mean, it's a great story. It's filled with daring do and bloody adventure and... Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> lots of tension um so yeah there's a lot to go through i mean one of the first things i wanted to say uh, sort of just a overview is that um drake was involved in sort of three four depending on how you want to count it maybe five different incredible different things in his life you know like most people that uh, go down in history for one reason or another is for one thing isn't it mm-hmm. you know like for example i don't know golden brown <laughs> <laughs> He'll be in the history books for one thing, being Prime Minister once, and that's it, you know. Selling um, the gold at a really bad rate. Oh, yeah. That too. And having a weird mouth, jaw, tick thing. Do you remember that? We used to go... Remember that? <laughs> <Vaguely>. Anyway, <laughs> that's his most famous thing, that. No, um, you know, some people occasionally might go down for a couple of things, like um, Eisenhower, you know, being the supreme head of the army in World War Two and president later in the 50s. You know, you could sort of say there's two mm-hmm. things... Two completely separate things. Um, whereas Drake, it's sort of it's three or four, maybe five different things, completely separate episodes in his life, each of which is fantastic, unbelievable almost. Um, and so, yeah, sometimes people uh, just, they're born at the right time for events to pan out. And if you're lucky, you don't die, then you can be involved in multiple things. So um, anyway, Drake is one of those. It's sort of a quite a fantastic life, uh, filled really with interesting events. So, well, maybe we can just kick it off. You mentioned there that he's f- famously from Plymouth, a Devon boy. Well, um, it's Tavistock. Tavistock. Technically speaking, but Tavistock is, I don't know, about an hour's drive in modern times away from Plymouth. So it's right. about half a day's horse ride, I would imagine. So it's not very far away. It's the nearest town, but it's obviously the major port. And him being a, a naval man, he was more associated with Plymouth than his place of birth in Tavistock, which is right. still only small. I think it's only got about 14,000 people living there today. Uh, yeah. Been there many times. Very nice. Uh, very yeah, quaint. I've never been there. I've been to Plymouth, not been to Tavistock though, but um, I've heard it's quaint and very nice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can only say good things. <laughs> and, well, you know, um, Drake is sort of synonymous with Plymouth in many ways. Mm-hmm. I think um, if people know sort of any detail about Drake's life, they will equate him with Plymouth. Um, But the fact of the matter is, he spent nearly all his childhood, all his formative years, he learnt his trade in sailing and the Navy on the River Medway, which is in Essex. Um, So, yeah, there's... You're you're laying claim to him then. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But what what about all the statues in Plymouth, eh? (laughs) Well, the thing is, the Royal Navy, back in... So, let's put him in some historical context. Um, He was born during... Uh, the age of Edward, Henry's Henry VIII's son, who di- famously didn't live very long, died in his minority still. Um, and so um, Drake was actually his sort of formative years when he was a small child, first sort of becoming conscious of the world, would have been during the reign of Bloody Mary. Um, so uh, it's the whole story of that is is bound up with Catholics versus Protestants, isn't it? Uh, there's wars of religion going on in in Europe at the time. Um, lots and lots of uh, wars between Christians, uh, between those loyal to uh, the Roman See <laughs> and those that more favour uh, Luther and Calvin and, and and the Protestant forms of Christianity. And it was really quite bitter. Um, you know, like both sides mm-hmm. thinking the others are sort of evil heretics. You know, so it's really quite bitter. But it didn't really spill out in as badly as it might have done in England. 
um, because Bloody Mary died of sort of natural causes and her little sister uh, Elizabeth took over who was a Protestant but um, sort of kind of famous one of the things she's known for is that she was quite relaxed when it came came to religion people were allowed to sort of um, do whatever their own conscience dictated to a degree I mean she, mm -hmm. the people were still executed <laughs> and imprisoned I mean I've put a, quite a rosy tint on that there was it was, it was still quite dangerous to be a Catholic at certain points in England, depending on what you did, you know, if you tried to spread Catholicism at certain points, you would be in trouble. But mainly, um, you were sort of, uh, it, it was quite relaxed. But in the age of uh, Mary, when Drake was a small boy, there was a thing called Wyatt's Rebellion, um, because uh, uh, Mary gets married to Philip and of Spain, and people were ex extremely worried that... Britain would just become a Catholic country again. It would, because, it, of course, Spain is Catholic, yeah, isn't it? And yeah. our traditional enemy, really. It would just become... An, England, Britain, would just become one more of Spain's holdings. Um, and it's not that paranoid or crazy to think well, that. Well, of course not, no. I mean, Spain was relatively powerful at the time. Probably Very, the, well, the most powerful country it was, in the world, yeah. easily. Yeah, yeah. Philip II of Spain was the most powerful man in the world, mm -hmm. kind of easily, I would say. Um, and he's an interesting character. He's, you know, he's not like a completely insane, um, you know, like Inquisition type. But he is <laughs> staunchly Catholic, though, you know, and staunchly committed to expanding Spain's empire wherever possible. And um, is that why you reckon he, he got married to uh, Mary? Was it Mary? Or yeah, was it yeah, Elizabeth? yeah. No, Mary, yeah. So, uh, well, a big part of this, there was lots of wars going on in the Netherlands, Spanish-controlled Netherlands, at that time. Um, and Britain kept bankrolling and helping out the Protestants in the Netherlands. And so it was quite clear from Spain's point of view um, that it would be better to have England on side rather than an enemy. So one way of doing that is to sort of marry into the royal line, mm -hmm. marry the, into the Tudors. Uh, but when Mary dies childless, um, Elizabeth is sort of the young Queen Elizabeth I is known as a Protestant. There's just no real question that she would marry Philip. I mm -hmm. don't think he wanted to marry her even. Um, and anyway, it all comes to a head with the Spanish Armada. But that's much later. That's when that's when Drake is uh, a full-grown man. But um, that, that's one of the last great episodes, or probably the last great event that he was involved in. Mm -hmm. And that's 1588. So that's towards, towards the end of his life. Uh, but going back to the beginning, there was Wyatt's Rebellion, which was a bunch of English noblemen, quite a lot of them Catholic, um, tried to rebel against the crown because they weren't happy with this royal match. So it's not just a case of Protestants just simply rising up in uh, as a reaction to Philip and Spain. There's lots of Catholics, even British English Catholics, were suspicious and worried about it. So what was, what was their motivation then? Because I can understand why the Protestants might be wary, but I, I can't necessarily see why a Catholic would be wary of more Catholic influence in Britain, right? Well, there's two layers of mm -hmm. um, religion and nationality. So even though Philip might be a, a Catholic, he's still a foreigner, he's still a Spaniard. <laughs> So you know, it, runs, it runs deeper than uh, yeah. anti-Spanish sentiment is more important than God <laughs> to Britain, apparently. We could argue that in the case of Wyatt's Rebellion. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But in the end, it was put down. I mean, it was put mm -hmm. down quite easily. But it did revolve around the sort of the southeast of England, where the Medway is. Mm -hmm. And um, Drake was Drake's father was a lay preacher, a, a, a Protestant lay preacher in the southeast of England. So... It was a bad time to be that in the age of Bloody Mary, where she was burning people alive for being heretics. Um, and Drake was the eldest of 12. He had 11 siblings. That's crazy. Uh, which me, is the, crazy, yeah. The, just the family sizes in the past. Is, yeah. I, I don't know. It's difficult to get your head around, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah, no such thing as contraception or anything. <laughs> but, well, I mean... And anyway, his mum died when he was still young, still a boy. Um, maybe just of exhaustion. I mean, 12 kids in quick succession. Yeah. I mean, there's no no mean, mean feat. And his father was sort of this penniless lay preacher that would go around and um, scrape together a few pennies for leading people in prayer. 
in English, you know, to a, a real proper Catholic in the 16th century, um, that that's an evil thing to do. <laughs> You know, so anyway, his uh, his father had to be extremely careful, and they were really quite penniless. I think um, at some point, I think there's accounts that they lived on a a, a tethered up hulk, you know, like a, a, an old ship that's permanently tethered, and that um, it, there's, there's like a prison hulks. Have you ever heard of those where they would have a big old ship tethered out to sea, and uh, it'd be used as like a, a prison ship? I think they did that um, in in Plymouth with Napoleon. Um, oh right, was he held on one at one point? Yeah, um, oh, okay. he was held in Plymouth Sound, and um, he—he, he, I remember this is just a, a tidbit of information. He described the the breakwater, which had just been constructed around that sort of time, as one of uh, the greatest achievements of man. Oh wow, that's interesting. Yeah, Funny. which uh, coming from Napoleon, I, I imagine that's quite a compliment. Yeah, no, just absolutely. A throwaway bit of history for you. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that. That's very interesting. Also, um, when it, this is another. Another tangent, but when he was being held out um, in this prison boat, um, loads of people, because he was so famous, would take boats out to see him out <laughs> on deck, kind of patrolling around on the on the top deck, and um, supposedly so much so that one woman drowned just trying to get a glimpse of him. Hmm. Um, so there we go. I can believe that. I would probably if I if I lived out that time. Or if oh I yeah. Could, if I could catch a glimpse of. Old bony, I think I probably <laughs> would try. <laughs> there's a there's a, uh, a long running uh, theme in the sharp novels about if you can ever, if you know Napoleon's on the field, that every man sort of straining his neck to see if they can see see him, um, <laughs> just to catch a glimpse of the of the little Corsican. Um, anyway, that's a that's hundreds of years after this. Just an aside. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think Drake and his family lived on on a, on a hulk for a while, which is, you know, it speaks of penury, really. Mm -hmm. It speaks of being extremely poor. Um, and so as soon as he's old enough, really, um, his dad needs to sort of get rid of him in one way or another, needs him to sort of find a trade or, or to start making money of his own or start pulling his weight. So when he was quite young, very young, you know, as far as we're concerned, sort of 11, 12 years old, something like that, um, he sort of, he joins uh, the crew of a, of, a, of a merchantman, of a merchant ship, a small merchant ship. Uh, this was because, um, his, I think they were extended family or something in Plymouth, is that right? Or something um, like that. Okay, yeah, so straight away there's a connection between the Drake family mm -hmm. and uh, the Hawkins. That's the one, yeah. Um, so the, the Hawkins family come into it and, and they're sort of quite well to do. They're, mm -hmm. they're uh, at the very least middle class. Um, you know, at the very least, if not higher than that, there may be some sort of, sort of local minor gentry even. I know they've um, got a street named after them in, right. in Plymouth somewhere. Right. Well, there's a small story actually where Drake's dad, because Drake's story gets mixed up with that of uh, John Hawkins. Mm -hmm. So John Hawkins. But the generation before, before Drake was ever born, another John Hawkins, not the famous John Hawkins, but maybe his dad or his uncle or something another one of the hawkins um was <laughs> involved in highway robbery robbery with drake's dad <laughs> they literally ha like stopped someone on the highway and robbed them robbed their purse so he went from a highway um, robber to a, a preacher mm. and that was his father mm. and he lived on a boat mm. <laughs> it's quite the, the picture of the family life that he had. Yeah, yeah. And so he, the, the, that Hawkins and Drake's dad uh, were sort of uh, arraigned or they were sort of asked to answer for themselves, but they fled. Um, they fled. Well, in fact, that was probably why um, Drake's father originally fled Devon uh, mm -hmm. or the, the Plymouth Tavistock region was to escape these charges. Because, um, of course, being, being a highwayman in that area as well, it's pretty easy to get away. Even to this day, it's pretty wild out there. <laughs> so um, you've got lots of avenues for escape. Apparently the local lord did eventually pardon him, but he'd already left for the southeast of England, so he raised his many children on the Medway, River Medway. Mm -hmm. Now, places like Portsmouth and Plymouth are sort of famed for being sort of the great ports of the Royal Navy. Uh, but back then, the Royal Navy was tiny. I mean, I wouldn't say non-existent. It certainly existed, but it was tiny. I mean, tiny. The Crown had a, a handful of ships, warships, just not very many at all. Uh, and anyway, a lot of them were were tethered up on the Medway. Um, and it, because there's sort of, it's, it's good for the sort of some, when the tide goes out, there's some nice mud flats there where the ships will beach and you can then scrape the 
the barnacles off and, and, and recork them and things. The Medway's good for that. Um, you know, Portsmouth Sound isn't good for that particular thing. Um, so anyway, at this time, Medway, the, 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 the young Drake, would have seen lots and lots of shipping and the Royal Navy, as, as was. Um, he would have seen that his whole boyhood on the Medway. Um, so sort of no wonder it um, sort of fired his imagination or there was no real question whether he will get involved in in um, sort of seafaring. <laughs> um, so anyway, he when he's uh, sort of a young teenager, a, a boy really, um, he goes, he, he sort of learns his trade for a few years on this merchantman, sort of a small ship, I think sort of a, a, a double mast ship with a crew of 20 or 30, so quite small, just mm-hmm. going across the channel maybe occasionally down to sort of uh, the Bay of Biscay. You know, nothing too extensive. Um, but but learning how to control a ship, you know, learning how to sail, learning how to tack into the wind, learning how to control men a little bit on ship, you know, learning the norms of what it's like to be on board. Um, and navigation. It seems that he, he had uh, some sort of knack for navigation, reading maps and things. Um, uh, and so by the time he's about... Well, not that old, sort of 17 or 18 years old or so, um, the captain of that small ship, who seems to have thought of Drake as a surrogate son on some level, because he died and left the ship to Drake, <laughs> which is kind of incredible, really. Mm. I mean, cause, so Drake's still young, it's like 18 years old or something like that. And suddenly he finds himself the owner. He went from a penniless boy, quite literally penniless, to... Owning this ship, I mean, it's not a big ship um, at wasn't all. It, but um, um, wasn't it on an expedition? Correct me if I'm wrong here. I might just be misremembering, but wasn't it? Um, and wasn't he associated with the Hawkins family for quite a while? Um, and these expeditions were to do with them, and it was someone in their employ that left him the ship. So that I suppose that would give him a bit more of a senior position, at least if I'm remembering correctly. Okay, I mean, I'm not entirely sure about that. So the the Drake family and the Hawkins family are definitely connected by mm-hmm. relations since way back. Sure. So that's always there. And mm-hmm. he definitely goes on soon after this to get involved in expeditions of the Hawkins family directly. But as for whether this original guy who bequeathed Drake that, that, that ship, mm-hmm. whether he was connected to the Hawkins, I'm not sure. I actually don't know that. Okay. Um, it's one of those things, you know, I know we're recording this for content. I don't want to just say, yes, <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, well, so. with, with these sorts of things, especially when <laughs> he wasn't a notable figure, it's mm. not really going to be written down. It's not like yeah. today where you've got a ship's uh, logbook and it just tells you all of the previous owners and all of this sort of stuff. That's a modern thing. It didn't really happen then. You could pass around a ship and the, the crown would have no idea about it as far as they yeah. were concerned. Actually, maybe it's worth taking just a couple of minutes to talk about um, the historiography of Drake very, very quickly. Sure. Uh, just super quickly. Um, might be a good moment to... Um, the, in some ways, there's a fair amount of detail. In other ways, not. Um, so there's a fair amount of uh, people still got their letters and things that they sent to each other. People that were on part of his crew and things um, wrote about it during his lifetime. And there's chroniclers... Drake becomes extremely famous in his own lifetime. Um, and so people wrote about it at the time. Um, so there's, there's, in, in some ways, there's, there's plenty of information. But then in other ways, there's sort of a dearth of information. So, for example, sort of, you know, parish records um, aren't completely complete. So we don't know, you know, exactly what year some people were born. And, you know, we don't have the manifest or the logs mm-hmm. of every ship he was ever on, including these early ones. So we don't know all detail. And then also, Drake becomes something of... Uh, his story in later life becomes mixed up with sort of um, state secrets. Um, and so some of his later voyages become sort of politically sensitive, exactly what he did and didn't see, exactly where or where he didn't go. And so a lot of it becomes... Or quite literally that, a state secret. So it was one uh, one of his m- most important voyages. When he got back to England, all his records were taken by Queen Elizabeth's spy masters and kept under lock and key in the Tower of London and have never been seen to this day. They were spirited away and disappeared and they're lost to history to this day. So I think that's... Uh, that's just an example. Mm, there's uh, a series of 
video games actually called the Uncharted games, which base <laughs> predicates their entire um, thing, their entire story on the idea that Drake's um, missions that were Uncharted were kept under lock and key. And there's lots of uh, scope for mystery there mm. and being kind of, I don't know, what's having a poetic license with some of the history of it, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as as a as a confirmed and committed history nerd, <laughs> I would love it if one day there's news that uh, in some archive somewhere in the British Library, or maybe there's an archive in the Tower of London itself, or the House of Lords Library, or something or other, the Bodleian Library, something that Drake's uh, paperwork turns up. Um, that would be incredible. It might happen as well. Mm. Maybe one day. I mean, who knows? Uh, it seems unlikely now. Uh, but maybe, I mean... My my biggest worry would be that it it would kind of emerge and then it would be really mundane. Like, right, yeah. yeah that's... 50 days at sea, yeah. you know, still water. Uh, great. Well, it will emerge, we didn't find the Northwest Passage. That's it. That's the headline. <laughs> we didn't find what well, we were we, looking for. We know he definitely didn't find that. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. The uh, the Franklin expedition, things like that, much later. Well, we get, we're getting ahead of ourselves yeah. a little bit there. Um, <laughs> um, so, well, okay, well... Uh, already spent a bit of time here. Maybe we go through it a tiny bit quicker. So, yeah, once he's bequeathed this this relatively small um, sloop, I don't know if it's what exactly type of ship it it's was. It's just a small uh, boat, isn't it, really? Yeah, it's, it's, it's perfectly good for channel hopping mm -hmm. and for going up and down coastlines, but it's not sort of... Well, you can't cross the Atlantic in it or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, you could probably uh, cross the channel, but yeah. not, as you said, the Atlantic. Um, so, Drake just sells that boat straight away. He doesn't decide to sort of become the captain of it and start trying to make a living in sort of, uh, you know, cross-channel commerce or anything. He just sells it. And a, a lot of the hands, a lot of the crew on that boat sort of follow him now. They're sort of his. And so he decides that he's going to take that money and the small number of men uh, that are in his train um, and he's going to go back to Plymouth. He's going to go back and... Um, Try and make a name for himself there and um, try and get a, a, a commission or try and get another boat or just try and continue his sort of fledgling career there. And so when he gets there, it's um, the Hawkins family are, as I say, are still and have been for a long time sort of uh, an important family. And because they're sort of connected by, um, uh, by blood on some level, um, it sort of kind of makes sense that he gets in touch with Sir John Hawkins, the, this, by mm -hmm. now it's the famous Sir John Hawkins, of which you can find portraits painted of him. And says to him, you know, like, <laughs> can, can you give me a job, <laughs> basically? Is there anything I can do for you? Um, and it seems that um, it's, it's one of those points when you look back as a historian, when you have to sort of read between the lines or read uh, or, or sort of try and understand what can only be inferred by what we don't know for sure. But what you can say is that Drake must have had a personality about him. You know, mm -hmm. he, he couldn't have been a shrinking violet. He couldn't have been uh, sort of a wishy-washy, uh, nothing type character. He must have had a, a force of will uh, of so, on some level to have. He's only 18, 19 years old. Mm -hmm. And yet men, seasoned sea dogs uh, prepared to follow him. And, and, and John uh, Hawkins is prepared to say, yes, I'll give you a, a role and quite a senior one mm -hmm. um, on one of his on one of his expeditions. Well, I suppose it, it's a pretty good... Uh CV, so to speak, to turn up with a bunch of money and men to right. start your own expedition when you're at such a young age. It must be an indicator that you've got potential there mm, as well, yeah. just purely based on the circumstances in which he turned up. Well, definitely, it says that you're not a complete loser, doesn't it? It says <laughs> that, it says that you're, on some level you're capable of mm -hmm. some things. You know, some people just seem to be... Um, kind of inept at whatever they try. They're sort of inept at it, you know. Um, and it seems that Drake wasn't there. He sort of switched on, maybe, is another way of putting it. Um, you know, he, he, he's looking at the world with his eyes open. And, um, uh, and yeah, he's no fool. He's no fool. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.